Hi, this is John Harch, and welcome to episode 19 of Valleys of Numenor, and after many delays, it's finally here. Welcome to the world of Robert E. Howard. We're going to start with Conan and see how many different parts of the Robert E. Howard universe we can directly connect. We'll tie in Cull, Rand MacMorn, Turlough O'Brien, Francis L. Barack Gordon, and any number of Allisons, Brills, Costigans, and Reynolds. Then we'll see who's on the outside looking in. Surprisingly, one of the big ones isn't as tied in as you'd think. Okay, we're a few months late with this, but better late than never. Once again, I have to thank right up front all the guys who laid out the little bits and pieces along the way. Patrice Linier's essays are so full of info, it's all right there in front of you. Rusty Burke's intros to a lot of the books are also chock full of little bits to work with. Uh, David Hardy did a couple of intros for the El Barak volumes. Um, speaking of El Barak, Rick Lye recently did an internet piece laying out a lot of uh, characters and how they were tied together. And of course, the late Mr. Steve Tompkins, who discovered this on his own as Rusty laid out in the intro to Swords of the North. They blazed the path. Think of me as just paving the road. So let's start with the Hyborian Age. This was the essay Robert E. Howard wrote in 1932 when he started coming up with all kinds of ideas for the world Conan inhabited. The countries, the people, the history, you name it. In a sort of interesting piece of symbolism, he starts off by talking about the world inhabited by his previous ancient barbarian king, Cull. And much as Phoenix on the Sword came out of the ashes of an old Cull story, the Hyborian Age rose from the ruins of what he now called the Thurian Age. So what was Cull about and how come he didn't do as well as Conan? We have to go back to Howard's teen years, where well, we'll actually be dealing with a lot this episode. One of his first bits of writing was patterned after an author back in the early part of the 20th century named Paul L. Anderson. He wrote a group of prehistoric stories, and Howard basically just lifted them and wrote about a different character in the exact same realm. He named his character Amra. Not with a dash in there, but sounds familiar. He did some poems about the character that weren't discovered until the late 60s, as well as a story about him and another character, a young man named Cull. It doesn't appear that it's known if Howard was writing about Amra and Cull just ended up taking over in his mind, or if he set out to use his old backdrop to introduce a new character. But in the end, he started writing about Cull, king of the ancient kingdom of Volusia. Cull was from Atlantis, but not the same Atlantis we're used to. This was a wild island continent with nothing resembling civilization. That was represented by Volusia and its neighboring kingdoms. Howard first came up with the story called the Shadow Kingdom, generally regarded as among the earliest of what would become the sword and sorcery genre. It also established many other things Howard would continue to write about the rest of his career. He had a barbarian king who had a long and storied life before ascending the throne. His enemies were a race of snake people, various forms of which would turn up in stories we'll discuss. And he continued to expand his concept of the Picts in the form of Brule the Spear Slayer. We'll talk more about them once we're done with Cull since they intersect again in the final story about the Atlantean. Howard finished the Shadow Kingdom in late 1926 or so, sent it off to Weird Tales, which had published a number of his stories in 1925 and 1926, and it got accepted. So he went off and did another, The Mirrors of Tuz and Thun. This got accepted as well, so Howard figured he was on a roll. He tried one story about Cull heading toward the River Stages, their version of the River Styx, but it didn't get finished. He next did a story about a future scene cat, but almost as he finished it, came up with the idea to make the bad guy a wizard with a flaming skull called False of Doom. Patrice mentions in his essay he isn't much of a fan of Del Cardi's cat or the cat and the skull making the bad guy as clear as day, and apparently neither was Farnsworth Wright, editor of Weird Tales, who turned it down. To me, it may not be top-notch, but I can't imagine it's any worse than anything else that appeared in Weird Tales around, you know, 1929, 1930 or 
you know, other than the stories by the biggies, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith, C. Barry Quinn, you know, those guys. Howard tried another cult story, this time using a character he introduced in Del Carty's Cat Slash Cat and the Skull as a sort of coincidence. You know, they had this new slave who also happens to be the greatest scholar of the era. Lucky for them. So he did the Skull of Silence, or the Screaming Skull of Silence, but that didn't sell either. He tried a few more fragments before putting aside the character for a bit and dropped Cthulhu's The Scholar altogether. Well, not exactly. He originally called the character Cthulhu's instead of Cthulhu's and decided to use that name for an ancient wizard revived in the modern era. Again, sound familiar? He'd be from Atlantis, but a more recognizable version of it to us and give him a distinctive look that the title of the story would come from. Skullface. We'll get back to this one in a little bit. So after that break, a few short stories and a bunch of fragments, Howard took two more stabs at cult. His earlier stories were very atmospheric and ethereal, you know, even thought-provoking at times but obviously not what Farnsworth was looking for since after the first two, he didn't take any more. In one case, Howard may have realized the story's mirrors of Tuzanthun and striking of the gong were similar, so he submitted the latter to Argosy, but it wasn't accepted. So when he went back to the character, he had called battling more earthbound enemies. But by this axe I rule and swords of the Purple Kingdom were rejected as well. We've talked about the first one quite a bit, Ironically, by adding a more supernatural element to it, it ended up being accepted in its Phoenix on the Sword iteration. The latter story had a female character named Del Cartes instead of Del Cardiz. See, he doesn't throw anything away. Other than a poem about Cull, called The King and the Oak, which was published in Weird Tales posthumously, the final time Cull appeared in print was as a secondary character in a story but also as the title character of sorts. Kings of the Night appeared in the November 1930 issue of Weird Tales. In it, a great battle is about to happen, and a king is trying to gain allies to fight on his side. They give the king a condition. If he can bring them a king, not involved in any of their disputes, they'll follow him. A wizard then somehow is able to call Cull forward from thousands of years in the past and battle alongside warriors a few hundred years Anno Domini, in the common era. When Cull arrives, he mistakes the king for his ally Brule. This is because, like Brule, the king who called him forward is a picked himself named Bran Mac Morn. As we briefly mentioned during the Conan series, Howard had a practically lifelong obsession with the Picts, but not necessarily the historical tribe of people from Northern England and Scotland. Howard's Picts were a people on the outskirts of civilization from the early days of Thuria all the way until the time of Bram MacMorn, after which they seemingly disappeared. Howard came up with the idea of the character when he was back in high school. On the surface, his name could mean Raven, Son of the Morning, but that would be Mac with a C rather than a K. He wrote a play about him that really wasn't complete, but it left ideas on the page he could work with. It wasn't until the late 20s that he finally wrote a story about him. Men of the Shadows was the first story about Bran, and had the king meet with his ancient wizard to go over how the Picts got to where they were and how they would move forward. He submitted it to Weird Tales, but it was rejected. Farnsworth Bright wrote a good supportive letter about the story and why he had to take a pass on it. I think he could have summed it up a bit more simply. Bob, you already submitted this story to me and I accepted it. It's called The Lost Race. The Lost Race appeared in Weird Tales in 1927 after being submitted as far back as 1925. On many levels, it bears resemblance to Men of the Shadows. In both tales, someone relates the story of the Picts, their past, and the future. I have to think Howard used the ideas he came up with for the people in the earlier story because who knew if there'd be another one? Howard set aside the character for a few years before returning to him in Kings of the Night. Then the next time he turns up, it was in a couple of stories that appeared in Weird Tales in 1931, but Bran doesn't exactly show up in person. In Children of the Night from April, a Bran cult is mentioned as the heroes investigate strange creatures, 
Then in The Dark Man from November, Irish warrior Turlo Dub O'Brien, or Black Turlo, becomes involved with transporting an odd statue. At the end of the story, it's revealed the statue is of Bran Mac Morn, the last Pictish king who died in battle, leaving his people to scatter and disappear into history. It was after that when Howard came up with the final Bran Mac Morn story, Worms of the Earth, that appeared in Weird Tales in November 1932. And guess who showed up the next month? In the story, Bran has to find a way to confront a Roman legion looking to take over the land. He makes a pact with an old witch to bring forth the worms of the earth to defeat the invaders. When they come, it's never exactly clear what they are, but since they are referenced to as children of the night, it can be assumed they're similar to the creatures in that story. Now, their lineage goes back to an earlier unpublished story named The Little People. Then moving forward, there are two possible endings for this cycle. The first is in the story of the people of the dark, which ended up in strange, not weird, Tales in 1932. A love triangle spans the eons as a modern man remembers his earlier incarnation as a warrior named Conan. Just not that Conan. The trio battles a group of odd creatures that degenerate through the years until one of them shows up in the modern age. There's also an unpublished story named Valley of the Lost, where a Texas feud runs smack into a lost race of creatures who may or may not be the children of the night or the serpent men from the Cull era. We'll go back to Texas and another fictional resident and how his tales tie into everything at the end of the episode. Now, Howard ended up trying to make a series of tales with Black Turlo. Chronologically, the first would be his account of the Battle of Clontarf from 1014. And as usual, he took two passes at the story due to it not selling in its original form. A straight historical version named Spears of Clontarf was offered to Soldier of Fortune, but wasn't accepted. So he rewrote it with a supernatural element that might appeal to his usual outlet weird tales and named it either Twilight of the Grey Gods or the Grey God Passes, something like that. This failed to sell as well. The Dark Man would be next in the Turlo saga. Then a third story, Gods of Dal Sagoth, did get published, oddly enough, a few months before The Dark Man. And this would be the last time this happened to a Howard character, that things get done out of sequence. He also appears in a poem and an unfinished fragment named Shadow of the Hun. Howard still didn't give up on Clontarf, though, and a version of it finally saw print in Weird Tales and the tale Karn on the Headland. Bran Mac Morn wasn't the only character Howard developed from his teen years. He came up with a couple of adventurers, Frank Gordon and Steve Allison. These developed into the characters Elbarak and the Sonora Kid. And there's another tie between these characters other than when they were created. In a 1935 article, Howard mentioned Elbarak's physical appearance is very much similar to Bran Mac Morn. Considering how much Howard loved the Jack London novel, The Star Rover, which was about one body living different lives and reincarnation, you could almost make an argument that Elbarak was the reincarnation of the Pictish king. I'm actually kind of surprised no one has ever tried to write a pastiche about this. Howard had other outlets apart from Weird Tales who printed his stories. Magazines like Top Notch and Thrilling Adventures focused more on straightforward action stories, so he tried his hand at a number of those. We'll get to his crusade era stories in a bit. For his more modern adventure stories, instead of immediately reviving Elbarak, he created another Irish adventurer, Kirby O'Donnell, whose main difference with his predecessor was his big mustache and big saber. Two of his adventures were printed, though, out of order and in different magazines. Swords of Shaharazar was in top notch in October 1934, while the first story in the series, called either Treasure of Tartary or Gold from Tartary, appeared in January 1935 in Thrilling Adventures. A third story, called either Curse of the Crimson God or Trail of the Bloodstained God, was reprinted in the 70s. This was one of those stories El Sprague de Camp Conanized in 1955 in Tales of Conan. But he couldn't leave his old creation alone, and El Barak was revived in a series of stories that appeared in Top Notch in late 1934 and mid-1935. The first story written wasn't accepted and didn't see publication until the mid-70s. Swords of the Hills, or Lost Valley of Iskander, 
was a sort of riff on the man who would be king with Elbarak finding a lost city descended almost directly from the days of Alexander. This one didn't sell, maybe because they felt it was too derivative of the earlier work, but the next one did, the daughter of Erla Khan in the December 1934 issue of Top Notch. Howard used the name Ehrlich on several occasions, but none were explicitly connected. Interestingly, the female in danger in this story was named Yasmina, making it one of the stories that make up the Yasmina trilogy, along with people of the Black Circle and Almerick. This was a direct lift from Talbot Mundy, author of King of the Kyber Rifles. Mundy's stories were a big influence on the Elbarak series. Howard's next foray with the desert adventure was Three-Bladed Doom. Here he reintroduced a couple of other characters from his earlier stories, Yar Ali Khan and Lal Singh. Unfortunately, the story was not sold, so he tried to rewrite it to a shorter version, but that story didn't sell either. It finally did see the light as a colonization that the camp renamed the Flame Knife and appeared in Tales of Conan. His next two Elbarak stories did make it into the June and July issues of Top Notch. Hawk of the Hills brought Yar Ali Khan back, as well as his maybe relative Koda Khan, another character from the early stories. Blood of the Gods the following month was another story where cursed jewels are compared to blood. The final two Elbarak stories were sold but didn't see print until after Howard's death. Howard's title, Sons of the Hawk, was changed for publication in Complete Stories to Country of the Knife in August 1936, while Son of the White Wolf appeared in the December 1936 issue of Throwing Stories. These also featured more members of the Khan family of characters, Alaf Dal in the former and Zangi in the latter. There was one more desert adventure story, and Ayar Ali did appear alongside hero Steve Clarney in Fire of Asher Benapal. We're not sure if it's the same Yar Ali as Yar Ali Khan. This was another story where Howard submitted it, it got rejected, so he rewrote it in hopes it would get accepted elsewhere. It was first done as a straight up adventure. That didn't sell, so he changed the ending to something with a supernatural aspect to it, much like Spears of Klon Tarf into Grey God Passes. This did get accepted into Weird Tales, but didn't see publication until after his death. The first version, which is now thought of as the second, didn't appear until the 70s. But Howard wasn't completely done with these characters. Looking to another outlet for his stories, he tried his hand with some detective tales. His Steve Harrison stories found the most success getting three printed. In the third of these, Names in the Black Book, Kodakon makes an appearance tying these stories in. Oddly enough, Harrison's main antagonist in the other two stories was a crime lord named Ehrlich Khan. Obviously not the same one as the one in the El Barak story, since that was a mountain, but you can make whatever ties and connections you wish. He used the Ehrlich part of the name one more time as a title of a spicy story with Wild Bill Clinton named The Purple Heart of Ehrlich. Another outlet he had were magazines like Magic Carpet and Oriental Stories. He got a couple of tales printed with the quote-unquote hero being Irish crusader named Cormac Fitzgeoffrey. If Elbarak was the reincarnation of Bran MacMorn, he could almost see Cormac as the reincarnation of Conan, only in this case, Cormac came first. Their descriptions are strikingly similar, so it could be another case of Howard taking something he already created and using it again. The main difference is Cormac walked around with a giant shield with a skull on it. He had two stories in Oriental Tales in 1931, Hawks of Outremer and Blood of Belshazzar. He sort of had a third a few months later in Sowers of the Thunder. It references Fitzgeoffrey raiding the city of Shaharazar 50 years earlier and making off with a plunder of treasures. That city sounds very familiar to the one in that Kirby O'Donnell story. It all ties together. Magic Carpet was also the magazine that published the story Shadow of the Vulture, which had a female protagonist named Red Sonia. Just not quite that Red Sonia. Howard's has a Y, Comics has a J. Now, sometimes repeated names don't necessarily mean they're the same or even similar characters. As we mentioned, there was a Conan in the story People of the Dark that may have inspired the later Barbarian, but wasn't the same person, until Roy Thomas tied them together in the comic edit. There was also a character named Khan in the Klontarf Grey God Passes combo who was replaced by Conan in the comic version. Now, Howard had at least three different Cormacs. 
We just talked about the Crusader Fritz Jeffrey. There was also a Cormac in Kings of the Night who prompts Bran to go back and get another king his people could follow, hence dragging Cole forward almost 100,000 years. The third is an unpublished character, Cormac de MacArt. He's an Irish sailor who existed around the same time as Uther and therefore Arthur, so that would be sometime in the 500s or so. Originally, some people thought he was the same as the one in Kings of the Night, since the story Night of the Wolf appeared in the 1969 Bran Macmore paperback. But the Bran stories took place between 200 and 300 AD, so it's well before the other character. Howard wrote two stories and two fragments about MacArt, but none sold in his lifetime. The Sailor took on a new life in the 70s when Andrew Offutt and Keith Taylor created an entire series around him based off of the four Howard stories. We'll get to one more name with two different characters in a few minutes. Okay, that takes care of a lot of the historical material. There's a bunch of medieval stories that aren't directly connected, at least as far as I can tell. Plus, there's also the Dark Agnes tales. Think of her as the other half of the template that created Red Sonia in the comics. So let's go back to Children of the Night and head down the horror thread. The protagonist is, or maybe, John Carolyn, and he ended up having a string of stories written about his dealings with the supernatural. The question is exactly which stories does he and related characters appear in, and which ones are sort of understood that it might be them. Children of the Night has characters named Conrad, Carolyn, Clements, Ketrick, O'Donnell, and Taverl. The O'Donnell in this case is not Kirby, but John. Turns out Conrad's name is also John. Couldn't Howard have thrown in a James or a Jerry in there just to mix things up? Now, both O'Donnell and Conrad appear in a couple other stories that are horror-related along the way. Also around in the story is Nameless Cults. The next two stories where it's mentioned are The Black Stone from Weird Tales in November 1931 and The Thing on the Roof from February 1932. The narrator of both of these stories is unnamed, but it's possible it's Kirwan, or at least a Kirwan. The Black Stone was mentioned in several stories, but it doesn't necessarily appear to be the big rock out there in the middle of the Hungarian wilderness. There are several other unpublished stories which have Kirwans in them, but they may not be John. My buddy Deuce Richardson surmises that the one in Dermot's Bay may be the namesake of the ancestral head of the family, Michael. Now, the name Taverell is interesting. Not all of them are spelled exactly the same, but they're close enough to think they were like on different lines on Ellis Island or something like that. One of them refers to the character in Children of the Night. Another character with that name is Helen Taverell, a female pirate at the heart of Isle of Pirates Doom. The other two references are sort of related to Atlantis, but not necessarily calls Atlantis. Remember the abandoned character Cthulhu's who became the villain of the story Skullface? That story appeared in Weird Tales in October through December 1929, oddly enough, directly after the two cold stories. In it, a crime lord is revealed to be an ancient sorcerer from Atlantis. This Atlantis is more like the one we know, a civilization that ended up going under the sea. Howard started a sequel but didn't finish it. Its name might have been Tavril Manor, the name Richard Lupoff's completion. The Atlantis from Skullface is also similar to the one that appears in the backstory of the Solomon Cain tale, Moon of Skulls. In this one, the Puritan battler heads to the heart of Africa in search of a missing girl and finds an abandoned outpost of the sunken city complete with vampires. The girl's name, Marilyn Tafferel, with an F instead of a V, but it certainly seems to come from a similar source for the family name. Now, if you've noticed, I haven't really mentioned Solomon Cain at all. He's among Howard's more successful characters, having seven stories published between 1928 and 1932. Being a fantasy-based character, he was adapted in the comics at both Marvel and Dark Horse. But apart from the reference to Tavril and Atlantis, there's not really all that much in the Cain stories that ties them together to the wider Howard universe. There was one unsolved story, Blue Flame of Vengeance, that he transformed into a pirate tale, Blades of the Brotherhood, but he created a new protagonist, Malachi Grimm, instead of any previously used character. Black Romeo was a couple of years off at this point. This puts Solomon Kane in a camp with Howard's two most successful characters as far as the number of stories sold. Yes, even more than Conan. 
The two heroes of Skullface are John Gordon and Stephen Costigan. Gordon is another name Howard liked to use for his characters, apart from Francis L. Barak. Allison was another one, Steve the Sonora Kid being the most well-known. Then there's Reynolds, several of whom were involved in feuds. Cal had a personal one with Sal Brill in Man on the Ground from Weird Tales, July 1933. While in the posthumously published Valley of the Lost, John led his branch of the family, which also included the Allisons and Brills, first against the McCrills, then against the remnants of the Serpent Men from the Days of Cult. There was also the one Costigan name, but for two different characters. The hero of Skullface was a World War I veteran who had a drug addiction, but got better. It's possible he may have also been the narrator of The Little People, but that's unclear. His more popular namesake could be thought of a second cousin if you need to tie the families together. He was a brawling sailor with a bulldog for a pet, no mention of if he likes spinach. Now, interestingly enough, sailor Steve Costigan did appear in the same year as Popeye 1929, but Howard would likely have written any story with him close to a year earlier, much like the Hall of the Dead Jason and the Argonaut similarity we talked about last episode, or the way both Swamp Thing and Man Thing debuted in the same month in 1971, though they were in development on two different tracks at Marvel and DC simultaneously. On a related front, I may dive into the Rhapsody Rabbit Cat Concerto similarity at some point. Stay tuned. But as far as these go, it's just coincidence. Howard sold over 20 Sailor Steve stories that appeared in Action Stories, Fight Stories, and Jack Dempsey's Fight Magazine between 1929 and 1932. They were so popular, his Weird Tales editor, Farnsworth Wright, wanted in on the action. Howard took one of the Sailor Steve stories, changed the name to Dennis Dorgan, and submitted it. It was published in Magic Carpet under the byline Patrick Irvin, Irvin being Howard's middle name. That was the only one published in his lifetime. A number of others were published later, but ostensibly, they're all Sailor Steve Costigan. But believe it or not, Howard's most successful character is a big, brawling goofball named Breckenridge Elkins from Bear Creek, Nevada. In another odd comic-related coincidence, Elkin appeared the same year as another big, lovable goofball named Lil Abner. Elkins appeared in action stories 26 times between 1934 and 1937, now, I have to say, I've only read one or two of them, so if you dig through them, you may find some of Howard's usual names. He also did something similar with Elkins, creating new stories with the character, just by changing the name to Pike Bearfield so it could be submitted elsewhere. And in this case, it got him his lifelong ambition to be printed in Argosy Magazine. Unfortunately, the three Bearfield stories did not show up until October 1936, after Howard the last character I'll deal with is one who could technically loop in every single other Howard story we haven't mentioned, and he's an Allison. James Allison is a disabled Texan who may be on the verge of death, but somehow he can remember many different lives spanning the eons. The first story Howard wrote about him was Marches of Valhalla. It wasn't published in his lifetime, it finally showed up in the 70s. An early draft of the story explicitly links it to the Hyborian Age, but later drafts remove these sections. It's a strange story where Viking ancestors do battle in ancient Texas. It sort of reminds me of the old Yul Brynner picture, Kings of the Sun, where Aztecs end up in Texas and battle Blackfoot Indians on the Gulf Coast. A bit odd, to say the least. Saw it in KYW in Philly back when it was still an NBC affiliate, probably right before it switched networks. Two James Allison stories did see print back in the 30s. Valley of the Worm appeared in Weird Tales in February 1934, the month after Rogues in the House was in the magazine. In a similar form to Howard picking through the unfinished Conan material, he used some of the things from the unfinished Marches of Valhalla drafts for use here like the teaming up with the pick Gorm, or Grom, depending on the writing. Guess it was a pretty popular Pictish name. The hero is an acer named Mjord, who first battles the Picts, then they team up to battle a giant monster who lives in a hole in the ground. But it ain't Bilbo down 
Muir needs something extra to kill the beast, so he must get the poison of a giant python named Satha. Now, there's nothing in here to say that this Satha is the same one that Conan battled in the Scarlet Citadel. Their descriptions don't quite match, but if you want to tie them together, it is the same name. The story also yielded one of the best comic adaptations in Marvel's Supernatural Thrills number three by Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway with art by Gil Kane and Ernie Chan. The other James Allison story to see print made its way out in Marvel Tales, but not the same one that was a follow-up to Marvel Mystery Comics or the Spider-Man reprints. This was a small-time publication and only lasted five issues, but it was able to get stories by Howard, H.P. Lovecraft, and Manly Wade Wellman, among others. This time out, Allison is another Aesir, one named Hunwolf, and he first took his lover, Gudrun. Is Howard reading any D.H. Lawrence at this point? He took her from another big burly dude, then she gets taken away by a winged demon of some kind. It's kind of similar to the one Solomon Cain battled in Wings of the Night and that showed up in Almerich on another planet altogether. The Garden of the Title is one that has flowers that live on blood. At no Audrey Jr. or feed me Seymour jokes, please. Howard started a number of other James Allison stories, Rack and the Kelp, Guardian and the Idol, but he didn't finish them. Two of them, however, did get finished later. A fragment titled Akram the Mysterious was finished by Lynn Carter in the 70s and renamed The Tower of Time. It showed up in, I think, Fantastic Magazine or something like that. I actually have that one. Another one titled Jen Sarek's Fifth Born Son got an interesting completion. A total of 16 authors worked on a chapter each and came up with a story called Gore Kinslayer. The story didn't turn out as originally intended. Carl Edward Wagner and Richard Tierney, both who have done some well-regarded Howard pastiche, took the next two chapters after the Howard fragment and set things up in a certain direction. Then Michael Moorcock got the next chapter, and he did what Michael Moorcock does, you know, master of chaos himself, and everything went completely haywire and irreversibly set the story in a new direction. Shades of Last Jedi. Oh, well. So that takes care of a lot of the obvious links save one. One of the readers of Nameless Cults in the story was the mad poet Justin Jeffrey. His name appears in The Black Stone and Thing on the Roof, Howard's poem, Song of a Mad Minstrel, that appeared in Weird Tales in 1931, in the issue before Children of the Night, may either be written by him or about him. If you want to get into the reincarnation angle, he may be Ronaldo come to life a thousand years later. In the fragment known as The House, Conrad and Kirwan go to his old home to find out what they have driven him mad. In it, they mention some things in the Black Book, a.k.a. Nameless Cults, including mention of a lost era known as the Hyborian Age. Now, if you had shown it to me outside of a Howard book, I would have sworn this was fan fiction. It's just too perfect. But it came from Howard himself. It's all tied together. Jeffrey is also mentioned in at least one story by H.P. Lovecraft, meaning large portions of his work are also part of the universe. But that's something for another day. Whew. Boy, does this stink Glenn Beck's chalkboard or what? Like I mentioned, it is interesting how not connected Solomon Kane is to the wider Howard mythology other than Atlantis and the wing things in the final story. I may have to go back and do a little episode on him since he's certainly a key figure in the world of fantasy. I might also have to take a look at some of the other stories and see how or if they tie together. I didn't really delve into the Westerns or Crusader-era stories, but as I mentioned, there were a few ties here and there. So this basically sums up Robert E. Howard for now. Thank you for listening to all of this. Next time, we'll do another three initial author and his famous creation. Yes, it'll be Edgar Rice Burroughs and Tarzan of the Apes. We'll do a quick rundown of the original stories, then delve into his presentation in the mass media. There are plenty of Tarzan at the movies out there, but you haven't heard how I do it. That's next time at Valleys of Numenor. I'm John Hartjar. Thanks for listening to this whole series.